Okay, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here. It's really a great meeting. Uh, what I will talk about is some may know already. I talked about similar things in, in, in Bonn in 2018. Um, but I have new things and I, I looked at my talk then and it was had far too many technical details. So I tried to make it easier to digest this time. Um, so this is about this effort of getting concrete uh, computational content from proofs and about the problems you are facing when you do this and what kind of amendments you have to do to the logic to make it work smoothly. So this is, has been done for a long time now with the, the Munich group with Helmut Schwichtenberg and his people and also with Hideki Zwicky from Kyoto. And I'm glad that recently also people in constructive algebra are picking this up. So Peter Schuster and his uh, collaborators are interested in that. So I hope you, you find it interesting. So I tried to um, tweak the title that it fits a bit to this uh, theme of the workshop. So it has to be about incompleteness and computation. So uh, in computability, it means, of course, incomplete defined functions are functions that are undefined at certain points. Um, and in terms of programming, this means simply that a program may or may not terminate, but we cannot tell. That's uh, a well-known fact of life. And uh, the question is, how can we control this partiality, this incompleteness, uh, in an elegant and logical way? So we want to give proofs that can cope with possible inputs that are undefined and also may return undefined things, but are still correct. So that's the the, the main theme of this talk. So here's an example. Uh, this is due to Hideki Tsuiki. Uh, this is a very cute representation of real numbers by certain streams of digits, zero or one. And this is a very uh, special representation in that it is one to one. So each real number has exactly one representation, which is otherwise uh, usually impossible. Of course, there's a caveat, and namely the caveat is that one of these digits may be undefined, okay? And in programming, if you have such a thing given, of course, it's like a stream of programs or a, or a program that produces these programs one after the other. And one of these programs may not terminate if you query it. If you say, please give me the value of D7, if you're unlucky, it may run forever and don't give you the answer. Okay, that's the situation. I don't describe how this, uh, how, how this uh, um, representation works. It's nicely described in that paper by Hideki. Uh, it's just about that particular problem of having partial inputs. And how do we work with such a, a stream as an input? Well, um, the solution is because we know only one of them may be undefined. We just read two digits concurrently, for example, zero and one. And then we know that one of them must terminate because at, one, at most one may not terminate. And uh, what we do, we take the result of the one that terminates first and the rest we throw away. Of course, that looks a bit dangerous because uh, it might be the wrong choice or so, or the other one might be important. So it's not, not at all clear that this gives a sound way of computing and gives you correct results. Okay, but that's the problem you have to solve in that situation. And now let's uh, have a look at how we could model that uh, logically. So first we need a way of computing in concurrently. So we use an operator AMP uh, inspired by McCarthy's AMP. So it combines two program and when you execute it, it will execute M and N concurrently. And uh, they may not terminate or may, but we simply take the one that terminates first and the rest we throw away. So that's the meaning of this AMP, um, where we don't know actually nothing about how these programs run. So we don't want to schedule the stepwise computation. That's all kind of unknown to us. We just can run the programs and see what happens. Okay, and now let's uh, work with realizability. This is the general context here. I don't define what it means, but it means roughly it's enough for the talk to mean M solves the problem expressed by the formula A. And I, this is, it means M realizes A. And let's assume for that example that A has only defined realizer. So it cannot be realized by a non-terminating program. 
but usually these all formulas have this property. So it's not a, not a big restriction. And now um, we want to ensure that such a parallel or concurrent program realizes the formula. And one might be tempted to postulate that rule here. It says, let's say B is any condition that has no computational content. It's just an equation or something, but it's not necessarily decidable. Uh, so if B holds, then we know that M realizes A, then M is correct, okay? And if not B holds, then we know that N realizes A. And because classically B or B, not B must be true. So we use on the middle theory now, law of to the middle. We know that, um, that uh, AMP N, one of the two must terminate and we simply take the first one, it will realize A, okay? So that is a, a rule that's tempting uh, to uh, have a possibility to obtain the information that a concurrent program realizes a, um, a, a formula A. And we know that this will certainly terminate because one of the two conditions is satisfied, so one of the two programs will, will terminate. Okay, but unfortunately, this is a, a, an unsound rule. It doesn't work. Why? Because it could be that this M, for example, terminates first without B being true. So B could be false, but if B is false, we know nothing about the correctness of that value. We only know if B is true, then uh, it terminates N is correct. But it could be terminating anyway, even if B is false. So we would then return this M as a result of that concurrent computation. And we are not sure that this is a correct result. It may be actually false. So therefore, this is an unsound rule and we, can, we cannot work with that. Okay, how can we improve that? So in other words, if we postulate that rule, it's not realizable. So a rule is realizable if a realizer of the realizers of the premises or can be transformed into a realizer of A. Uh, or more precisely, this AMP program does not realize that rule correctly, as we have seen. So we have to fix it. And the fix uh, we propose is the following. Um, we have a stronger implication. So this should be read A restricted to B or A if B. So it's, it's, some people find it irritating that the order is the other way around. So A if B, you could read that. And this is a strengthening of, uh, of, of ordinary implication in terms of its realizability semantics. So what does it mean for an object A to realize that uh, restriction statement here? We define it as if B holds, then this A must be defined. And I just write A not bottom, with bottom for undefined, so it's defined. And whenever A is defined, then it's a correct realizer. And the important part is this one here, because this does not require B to be true no matter whether B is true or false, whenever A terminates, then it's correct, okay? If you compare this with the realizability of an ordinary implication B implies A, it would say if B is true, then A terminates and realizes A, but if B is false, we know nothing. But here we always know something if it terminates, so that's the difference. So we could say this is an implication that controls uh, non-termination or termination. Okay, and now this uh, rule can be realized by AMP. So the, the AMP realizes. So in other words, if we have a realize of A restricted to B and a realize of A restricted to not B, then the AMP of the two realizes guarantees realizes A. Okay, so we have now fixed this, but we the price is that we need a, a new kind of uh, implication that's a bit stronger. And to make this work, really, we have to label this A here in the conclusion, and we do this with two down arrows to make clear that here we accept concurrent realizers. Okay, so this means A, but possibly realized by something concurrent. Okay, and uh, if you do that, you get actually a quite nice logical system. And here on that slide, you see uh, the rules that one, one needs. Um, the rule we just discussed is this at the bottom. That's of course the one that's most important that we are after. It's a kind of a flow of excluded middle. So if B 
if B implies A and not B implies A, then A follows, but the program may be concurrent. And uh, uh, to get that, we need that. So we need also rules to infer this restriction. And the most important rule is actually the top one, because that's the only rule at the moment that allows us to genuinely infer a restriction from something that has no restrictions in it. And it's a very strange rule. Uh, you can uh, dwell on it. Um, it's If you read this as an implication and you read it in classical logic, it makes no sense at all. Of course, it's a valid rule, but it seems very redundant. But it's a rule that um, is one of the few ways of actually deriving this, uh, this uh, restriction operator. And the rest are just some uh, compatibility rules. Here we have uh, versions of, um, this is like a monadic rule, a bind rule. And here is like the return rule. We have anti-monotonicity in the premise and we have a modus ponens rule and x files a quad limit. And we, this says we can use classical logic in the premises because we are not interested in realizers. These are just conditions that need to be true. And for the, um, for the uh, concurrency operator, we have also nice compatibility rules. So this is a form of monotonicity or modus ponens. And here we have a like em embedding rule. Uh, and this is this, as I said, this law of explicit middle, which is the crucial rule that, that uh, makes it work. Okay, so that's the, that's all the rules. Uh, we have no information about completeness of these rules. They are sound in the sense they are all realizable. Okay, but they are enough to do what we want to do. And so what did we do with this calculus? Um, so first of all, we um, extracted programs that operate on this infinite gray code, this example, and also on compact sets that are in, um, uh, are represented by a version of that uh, infinite gray code from proofs, of course. And uh, another implication, uh, other application is um, uh, matrix inversion, the using Gaussian elimination. And if you do Gaussian elimination, you have a vector and you need to find a non-zero entry. And then you use that as a pivot element, you invert that element, but there might be a lot of candidates. They might be all very small. So you can find a non-zero entry concurrently by computing all of them uh, concurrently and then taking the one that programs uh, that terminates first. So this means that you gain an efficiency because you don't have to wait for the slowest program which you decided to go for, but you will get the fastest solution. So this actually speeds up uh, matrix inversion quite nicely and it's a provable concurrent correct program that does matrix inversion. And these are quite new things, so they haven't been published yet, but there's an archive paper with Hideki that uh, explains the theory of these AMP programs. And here's this uh, paper submitted with Dieter Spreen about um, compact sets. And uh, this paper also we just submitted is uh, about um, this concurrent Gaussian elimination. Okay, so this um, is kind of the uh, outcome uh, when you try to cope with partial inputs. Uh, how, how do you, uh, what do you do? You, you compute concurrently, and now we can actually extract programs uh, from proofs which are concurrent. Okay, so, but this is not the main topic I want to talk about. Uh, there is another, uh, issue that comes up with partiality. And this is uh, what I call vacuous truth. And uh, let's have a look at an example first. So here we have a simple statement, a bit strange. And you should tell me, or we can ask ourselves, what is the realizer of this statement? Um, if a certain big number is prime, uh, then there exists a prime number bigger than two to the power 10 to the power seven. And I can tell you this number on the left is prime. It's a Mersenne prime, uh, one of the largest known. I nicked this from Wikipedia. And what is a realize of that? First of all, the, it's an implication and the premise is just a condition. There's nothing to realize. 
So it should be a realizer of this existence statement that is actually a concrete with a correct witness if that is true. But we don't know whether it's true, but I can tell you it's true. So what a realizer of that would be, for example, this one. We can take that number that would satisfy this existence quantifier because it's certainly bigger than two to uh, this number and uh, it is a prime. But even if it weren't a prime, it would be a correct realizer because then this condition would be false and there's no condition on the right hand side. But we cannot take any number. We cannot take the number 10. That would not be a correct realizer, okay? Okay, what's the point of this strange example? Um, uh, there's a variation of it. It's the same statement. The only difference is that I removed that minus one here. Okay, and now we know, of course, this is a wrong statement because that's an even number. It cannot be prime. And what is a realizer of this statement? It's an instance of it's true by x false a quarter bit. So anything can realize it. Okay. So the two implications are very different, but in the logic, usually you can't distinguish them. They're just formulas that are true. But this is true for trivial reasons, and this is not true for trivial reasons. It's true for other reasons. Okay. And um, so, therefore, the second one is realized by anything, even for an, by an unterminating, non-terminating computation. It's a trivial, trivially true. Where the other one is not trivial true, it, you have a condition to realize it actually. Um, and therefore, we need to mark that. So to, we want to exploit that fact that some things are more true than others. I mean, they are trivially true. Uh, and, and we want to mark them. And we, we introduce a marker for them for V for vacuously true, okay? And we define the realizability interpretation that we, this under underscore here means we are not interested in the realizer. Yeah? Anything realizes um, that formula. The condition is that everything must realize the OA. So if, if, if A is realized by everything, then we don't care and we say it's vacuously true. Okay, so that's the definition of. So this formula has no computational content, yeah, because the realizer is completely irrelevant. But it's realizable if and only if everything realizes A. So that's this new operator. And examples are, of course, as we saw, an instance of x false or quadlibet is realized by everything, yeah. But there are more such formulas kind of that come essentially from x false or quadlibet. And um, yeah, that's what I just uh, said. And then you have again, uh, some simple rules, how to deal with this operator. So um, if A is true and it has no content, then it's vacuously true. And otherwise you can pull out this view to the, to the surface. So A implies VB, there's V, A implies B and so on. You can pull it out. And this works with AND and works with for all and works with exists. Okay, and but these were not so interesting. These were, but the really interesting rule is this one: you have a, a kind of a vacuous a law of excluded middle. <clears throat> Namely, it says if uh, not A implies B, and A implies vacuously B, then we know B. Okay, and the point is that this rule is realizable. It's a form of law of excluded middle. We don't assume A to be decidable or anything. It can be any formula. And uh, yeah, the rules are realizable, but let's look at the realizability of that uh, rule here. So we need to assume we have realizers of the premises. So A is a realizer of not A implies B and anything, I mean, and this is realizable. If you unfold that, so use the definition of that, you find uh, this means nothing, but if A is realizable, if, if A is, sorry, if A is not realizable, then actually A is a realizer of B. Okay, little, little A is a realizer of B. That's what that means. And this formula means if A is realizable, then everything realizes B. Okay. So we know one of these two conditions is true by classical logic. And so we can conclude that actually A is a realizer of B. Here because it's supposed to be a realizer and here because it doesn't matter. Anything is a realizer. Okay, so this is, uh, so we see that the law of excluded middle with this one stronger premise here is realizable. And that will be uh, exactly what we need 
to uh, extract the fan functional, which is the, the main goal in this talk. Okay. Right. So we have here another way of uh, dealing with possible undefinedness, because this means in particular that D can be undefined here. Okay. Um, now, so far we dealt with ways of dealing with possible partial inputs in a safe way. And now we turn the other way around. We, we want to ask ourselves, how can we generate uh, incompleteness in a safe way? Um, but of course, without compromising correctness. And the main source of incompleteness is of course, general recursion. If you don't put any restrictions to recursion, then you, you programs may fail to terminate. And our goal is to show that we can introduce general recursion safely. Uh, and this will be um, what, what I tell you in the next few slides. I mean, you could say in logic, we have no issue with termination because everything terminates. We work in a programming language like ODST. But if you look into the practice uh, program, any programming language always allows for general recursion and programmers are, don't like to be told by logicians what they can do, what they cannot do. They say, uh, we can take care of it ourselves. So we want general recursion. And here I want to argue that actually you can use general recursion just also in a logical safe way. And how does that work? Uh, I said it has to do with Brouwer's thesis. And what is Brouwer's thesis? Uh, it says roughly that every bar is inductive. Now, what does it mean exactly? So here we talk about uh, natural numbers and we think of natural numbers uh, coding finite sequences of natural numbers. So natural numbers can also be a code of a finite sequence. And a predicate P on natural numbers is a bar. If for any infinite sequence of natural numbers or a function from N to N, there exists a number N such the coded initial segment up to N minus one satisfies P. So you think of an infinite path and some initial segment uh, coded into a number satisfies P. And then it, you call P a, a bar. So for whatever sequence you take, there will always be a point when you are in P. Okay. And a bar is inductive if a certain predicate, inductively defined predicate, IB parts are inductive bar for P at the empty sequence holds or at, at the code of the empty sequence. And this is uh, defined inductively by two rules, very simple. Um, if a finite sequence satisfies P, then you, of course you are in the bar, then it is barred, sorry. And you have this kind of progressivity rules, a rule uh, if S, all one point extensions of S are barred for all N, then S itself is barred, okay? So that is an inductive bar. And this can be described a little bit more compactly. Uh, this IBPS is the least predicate that satisfies that equivalence. So IB has holds either if P of S holds or if for all N P S, or if one point extensions hold and you take the least predicate uh, then you get this definition, okay? That's an inductive definition. And therefore this uh, Brouwer's uh, thesis can be written as this scheme. If for all alpha there exists an NP alpha N, so if it's a kind of explicit bar, then it is an inductive bar. So that is Brouwer's thesis. And um, you can read a very nice account of this in Wim Feldman's uh, paper here. It, it is a very nice description of this whole thing. Um, and then Brouwer used this uh, 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 thesis to prove uh, bar induction. And there are many versions of bar induction. Here we have one for decidable bars. Um, it's an induction principle. It allows you to derive Q of the empty, finite, of the empty sequence. And there are three conditions. You must have a bar. And this P must be decidable and a subset of Q. And this Q must be progressive and that sense. So if all one point extensions of an S satisfy Q, then Q also uh, 
but then S satisfies Q as well. So you can sh shrink down and you will end up eventually at the, at the finite sequence. So this is a uh, bar induction for, for decidable bars. Okay. And now uh, let's discuss some issues with that uh, uh, bar, uh, bar thesis and the bar induction regarding are they useful for applications? So here's just a reminder what the bar a Brouwer thesis uh, says. Um, so one thing is it's restricted to natural numbers. It talks only about natural numbers and we want to talk about more general context. Um, it talks about infinite sequences. So this is, is here in, in a quantifier over infinite sequences. And uh, we know in particular in intuitionistic mathematics, this is a quite delicate issue. So we want when possible avoid to speaking about infinite sequences. And uh, regarding the computational content, the premise has content, namely it would uh, require for every such path to compute an N. And so a termination point, and these points are usually useless because they're anyway kind of worst case estimates and they're far too big. So this is like an unwanted computational content. And often you don't have this content in many. You don't have this available, this strong condition that constructively for every alpha you get an n, so you get a function. And also the conclusion has unwanted computational content. And why does it have content? Because it is defined by two rules and you can distinguish between the two rules. So this is also a content that, which is use, usually not useful. And uh, we require here that the bar for bar induction has to be decidable. And this is also a condition that's often not met. And to improve the situation, we now weaken uh, and generalize both the premise and the conclusion. And let's see how this looks like. Um, so we look at an arbitrary binary relation and uh, uh, so like an order relation. And think of this as being the extension relation. So uh, S is less than T if S is a one point extension of T. So that will be later the instance. But uh, here it's just an arbitrary relation. And we say uh, X has a path. If this holds, okay. And here by new, I mean greatest. So the path predicate is the greatest predicate that satisfies this equality. So, there's a path from X, then there must be a smaller Y that there's still a path, okay? So you can go from X, go down to Y, from Y to Y prime, etc. So it's an infinite path. It's an, an implicit way of expressing there's an infinite descending path starting with X using what we call co-inductive definition. So it's a, a largest fixed point. And completely dually, you just swap the exists by the for all and the implies, which is in, and the and, which is implicit here by an implies. Uh, you define accessibility. So an X is accessible if all smaller ones, Ys are accessible. So that's an inductive definition. Here we take the least fixed point. So that's a quite well known accessibility pro, uh, predicate. And uh, Classically, you can easily see that the path and, ac and accessible are complements each of each other. So an element X is, has either a path or is accessible, but not both. But that's, you need classical logic for that. And what I already said, path X means intuitively there is an infinite descending sequence. And accessible X means that you can do less induction at x. So the, the induction principle, uh, induction along the less relation is valid at x. That's what it, what it means. And uh, as I said before, to get the original uh, bar induction, you have to define the relation less in this way that s is smaller than t if s is a one point extension and this predicate p does not hold yet. Okay, it's not yet barred. Uh, and then you, you, you see that the original bar induction is actually a special ca case of that. Okay. Oh, so, sorry, that the notion of an inductive bar corresponds to this predicate and the notion that P is a bar corresponds to 
that there is no path. Yeah. Okay. So we have we can express the notion of a bar and an inductive bar in, in terms of path and accessibility. That's quite easy to see. Okay, so we captured the, the original situation. And therefore we can um, now rewrite uh, Brouwer's thesis. Uh, first of all, the implication, if X is accessible, then there is no in infinite path is easy to prove. It's an easy induction, its input seems to be valid. But the converse is the interesting one, it says, if x is barred, so if there's no infinite path, then x is accessible. And this, via this, if we use this translation here, this instance here would be exactly Brouwer's thesis, but here we formulate it in a more general context we are with respect to an arbitrary relation, okay? So this is a, an abstract version of Brouwer's thesis. And now the point is that this has no computational content at all. There's nothing to extract here. This is just a fact that is, is true, that you can accept or, or not. Yeah? It's a constructively uh, quite strong. You can prove from it, for example, uh, the Markov principle, uh, but it has no content as such. The content comes from somewhere else. So it has no unwanted content. So if you do program extraction, most of the time you spend work on getting rid of unwanted computational content. So that's just a matter of experience. Okay, it does not spoil program extraction, but it's a true principle. Okay, so we accept it. So that's this uh, Brouwer thesis. Now uh, let's talk about well-founded induction, which is something we use, which is in intuitionistically acceptable. Um, and here we have this progressivity predicate. It says um, uh, that um, uh, predicate P is progressive if for any X, if uh, P of Y holds for all Y less than X, then P of X holds. That's a usual notion of P is a progressive predicate. And then we can formulate the principle of well-founded induction says if a predicate is progressive, then all accessible points satisfy P, okay? And that is an instance of uh, strictly positive induction uh, that, uh, and, and that is realized by um, ordinary recursion, by full recursion, it's easy, easy to see. So this is a constructively valid or realizable principle. If a predicate is progressive, then it holds for all accessible points. But the problem is it's often hard to prove that a point is accessible. And this generalized Brouwer's thesis, which we have here, allows us to replace accessibility by not existence of a path. Okay, so we can replace that condition here by there is no path. And in applications, this makes a huge difference. This is often very easy to prove, whereas this is harder to prove, okay? So therefore, Brouwer thesis makes well-founded induction much more powerful and, and useful. Okay. And as I said before, uh, this well-founded induction is realized by general recursion. Okay, that's how we get another, it's another source of, of uh, partiality, incompleteness, but it's safe. Okay, and now you be used, we can use now this abstract form of uh, Brouwer thesis and well-founded induction to prove a more useful and more powerful notion of bar induction. And it's bar induction with so-called vacuous bars. And it looks as follows. So we have here an arbitrary relation and we let this be the reflexive and transitive closure. Again, think of this being S is less than T if S is a one point extension of T. Okay, that is the idea. And uh, S for ordinary bar induction, this has three premises, namely um, starting with any X zero and this X zero should be Think of it as the empty sequence in the concrete, uh, in, in the original bar induction. So fix a, a x0 and there should be no infinite descending path. Um, and 
the second condition is now um, for all we only we always talk about things that are less than x zero so in the, in the transitive sense yeah if p of x holds actually then our predicate q we are interested in is vacuously true that is where this new operator comes in it is vacuously true not only true it's vacuously true and then we have the same thing we have this uh, this um, uh, this progressivity condition say saying if uh, q holds for all y less than x then q holds for x and in the concrete example in the old example it would be if q holds for all one point extensions of s then it holds for s and then the same conclusion then q of x zero holds okay so this is an abstract form of bar induction and we can show that from the Brouwer thesis this uh, principle follows and the crucial point is that we don't require p to be decidable but we can pretend it to be decidable because we have this strong implication here and so we can use the law of excluded middle anyway even if this p is not decidable otherwise this is the proof exactly the same as for decidable bond action okay and the extracted program is interesting if you look at it it's a plane recursion in the wrong direction so it's a function h and um, that takes a sequence so um, the only thing that has computational content in these premises of these premises is three three has actually content and so we take a realizer of that and we use it to compute this function h of s which computes a realizer of that when we run it with the empty sequence which is the realizer of that x is less or equal itself in the star relations like the empty sequence of going down okay and uh, you see here you recursively call h with all extensions of s so you s is a finite sequence and you run it recursively with longer sequence so this is a clearly non-terminating recursion but magically it works anyway because that whole function is an argument of g and in the, intuitively this g must be continuous so it doesn't need this full function so that's the uh, but i don't want to go into details it just works but it looks like a crazy and wrong way around recursion okay but it's 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 a it's a correct realizer okay so we can realize that principle and now let's come to the fan functional um, um i think i need to speed up anyway a little bit um, just a reminder what is the fan functional it is a functional of type two so it takes uh, of type three sorry it takes functions of type two okay so an, an input for fan would be a function of type two that takes itself an alpha which is an infinite streams of zeros and ones and returns a natural number and given such a type two input it will return a natural number and what does it do it takes of this f here this is such an f here it computes the uh, least modulus of uniform continuity so we assume here that f is a continuous functional of type 2 and it will compute the least number n such whenever two inputs for f alpha beta coincide up to n then f will not be able to distinguish them it will give the same output f alpha is beta so this is the at least modulus of uniform continuity so that's the fan functional and by the fan theorem we know it's well defined but this is not an algorithm you cannot use this to compute fan okay it's just a definition and now you have to of course do a lot of work and in in my previous talk i actually uh, give details which is uh, quite boring i guess you have to formalize these functionals in in the right way and then you can prove using this vacuous uh, this uh, abstract bar induction with vacuous bar you can actually prove <coughs> uh, the 
the fan theorem. And the fan theorem simply says that every continuous function on Cantor space with values in n is uniformly continuous. And if you do it in the right way, then the extracted program will be exactly an implementation of that fan function. Okay. But it's essential that you have this bar induction with vacuous bars, otherwise it doesn't work. And now let's, ha let's have a look uh, finally at this program to see how it, just roughly to see how it works. It's written here in Haskell. Um, and here are the data types. So we have the natural numbers just we use to build in integers, but we only use this, the, the neg non-negative uh, values. Then we use the same type for the booleans, but here we only mean zero and one. And um, then we have type one objects, so functions from n to b, we call them alpha, beta. Type two objects, they were called capital Fs in the theory, but in Haskell, you can only use small letters. So we call them little f. So these are functions from b1 to n in type two objects. And uh, we also need concatenation and we concatenate an infinite sequence of Booleans, so an alpha with an S. Um, no, sorry, we, uh, this, is, this, this square brackets means finite sequences. So we, um, we concatenate a finite sequence S with an infinite sequence, so B1 are infinite sequences, and get another infinite sequence in the usual way. So this is the concatenation. It's a new function, and if n is less than the length of s, we just look up the nth element here, and otherwise we look up alpha. So this is a way of concatenating a finite with an infinite sequence. Okay. Then uh, crucial, of course, these programs are all extracted from proofs, but I just give you intuitive explanations here. Um, now here we compute the min arc and the max arc of a type two functional given an finite initial segment S. So min arc FS is an extension of S to an infinite path such that on that infinite path, F will assume a minimum because it assumes zero or one. So if at all zero occurs as a value, it will occur under this with this uh, computed min arc. And if the function at all will ever produce a one as output, this will be a stream that does it. And we do this all uh, with a given initial segment already. Of course, at the end of the day, we will run S with the empty sequence, we will use here the empty sequence. And here is actually the crucial uh, thing happening. Now, how is this computed, this minimum min, min arc? So how we, can we find out where F assumes its minimum? It seems to be impossible because it has uncountably many inputs. Um, we do it in the following way. Um, we uh, compute recursively. You see here we have a recursive call here. Here we have our S. We make a recursive call simply with an S with it extended by a zero at the end. And here we call recursively with S extended by one. So we make simply, first of all, before we do anything, we make recursive calls with longer S's. And we call this alpha zero and alpha one. Well, and then we just compare what F does on these values. And if this is the bigger one, sorry, if uh, we want here the minimum, if this is the smaller one, we take that. And if not, we take the other one. So this is obviously correct, provided this thing terminates, because it looks like this is never going to terminate, but the magic is it does terminate, yeah. But we don't have to prove this, this follows always from the, from the general theory. So here's where the, the magic happens, that we do recursion the wrong way around, without any stopping condition, which we have in usual bar recursion. We have a stopping condition, here we don't, we have no stopping condition here whatsoever. And then the rest is easy. It's just uh, using that. Uh, I'm afraid argument. we are running out of time now. Yeah. And then uh, we are done. Thank you, Peter. Uh, and that's this, this program. And it was known apparently before it has been extracted. And Martin Highland says it was already known to Robin Gandhi. Um, I also had invented it and some other people might have invented it as well. But here we can now 
eventually see where it comes from. It's just the computational content of the fan theorem, but we need to do some extra bits to get this extraction working. And uh, <clears throat> just some, some concluding remarks. Um, if we do this control of computational content, uh, we, we get new kind of programs. That is what I think find very interesting. And some classical logic seems to be needed. It seems to be needed for this vacuous truth and also for the concurrency. And um, it would be interesting if we can use this uh, generalized Brouwer thesis also to get programs that have been extracted, for example, by Berardi, Bitsam, and Coco and others uh, using classical dependent choice. Okay, here are some references and thanks for your patience and attention.